fifties and early turn turn of the, the, the millennium. They're back. They're they're already being built back. I'm talking rice. I'm not talking wheat corn. Corn corn is scary just because of the biofuel uh, as a thing. I, that 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 one. But uh, we're just talking rice uh, at, at the moment. But I th I think there's a, a fairly uh, there's, there's the two components. There's this sort of natural economic response to optimal size of stops, and then I think we will get some encouragement out of the the financial world, uh, the, the, the the world banks and the ADPs of, of the world to to figure out some way to encourage the larger countries uh, to hold a little a, a bit larger stocks. And we don't have to require these stocks to be accessible to the world market because these are countries that are big enough that the traders will know that it's there. Another quick thing too, I, the one thing I see is the old Isaac Asimov theory. We can all predict on trend, but you can never predict the outlier. And if you look what happened in Russia that, this last year, the 2008 ran, run happened without a food shortage. Russia's decrease in the crop goes back to the 70s and 80s great grain robberies. And so we can predict on trend, but you can't predict you know, the person that comes and is just a genius, which isn't me. The person that comes and you can change the very food functioning, and hopefully he's at here, you can start the second green revolution. Like what happened in Russia this year where they lost a third of the crop. You have an outlier in like China or any of the major eating Asian countries, Thailand, the Philippines. We've never experienced what happened in wheat in the 70s and 80s in rice. And if it would, if you had an outlier event, which global warming could cause, this discussion becomes very quickly mute of now you have to have major changes. So question here? Yes, please, and then the lady in front. First, first in the back. <laughs> Storage problems. Yes, we do uh, talk about the whole post-harvest process is something that there's considerable debate over whether we lose 30% of the crop before it gets to the consumer or maybe it's close to 10 or 12%. Anyway, there's significant losses uh, in, in the whole post-harvest uh, technology, and that's we include that uh, that set of recommendations in the sort of Erie rice side of things because Erie has a very good post post harvest research program that they do a lot of collaboration in, uh, on, on that uh, the, the, the new the, the, there's storage techniques that are using nitrogen now so you can store rice uh, much more effectively than we could, could have done uh, even even ten years ago uh, the milling technologies are are, are, are improving uh, Yes, that's a that's a serious question. Um, having said that, it's very expensive to store rice for very long. Even if you can stop the physical deterioration by appropriate investment in in the technology, it still just costs you money to have your money tied up uh, in, in 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 stocks. Inventory costs money, and so we don't lightly talk about urge larger holding larger reserves of, of grain of, of rice because we understand how expensive that is and in some fundamental sense how inefficient that is trade as a way of evening out production uh, instability is so much more efficient than trying to do it with large reserve stocks now the difficulty is if countries are going to prohibit trade, you don't have any choice. You need the reserve stocks. Um, yes, uh, storage. Uh, rats are a big problem post-harvest. And in Asia, they say some rats are four-legged and some rats are two-legged. Uh, World Wildlife Fund. Yeah. What kind of role does the private industry play in this total? in this uh, rice picture, like uh, companies like Arch, Daniel Midland, or Monsanto? Uh, I, for the report, in, in a footnote, I, I did a calculation. How, how large is the private sector as 
the, as a share of the world economy, and how much is it public sector and NGO and, and other? And the answer is, yeah, it's 95% private. That's farmers, the marketing system, processing, storage. Um, when, when you add up all the private actors out there, about 95% of the value of ultimate production uh, is in the hands of, of the private sector. That's different than asking of world trade, the stuff that crosses borders, um, how much of that is in the hands of the private sector. Jeremy knows a whole lot better than I do, but my, my, my sense is the actual physical logistics are virtually all private, but many of the deals get made as public. I, uh, maybe this is a question better for Duncan. I mean, I, I believe you're asking how much as far as donation comes from companies. In the, uh, I, I can just answer in research. Um, the main development for the private sector in research uh, has been with a, a technology called hybrid rice, um, which is, yes, yes. So I'm not going to talk about post-harvest mechanization research or anything like that for fertilizer or anything like that, which, which Peter quite rightly says is far and away, 90% is all private sector. Just from the institutes, if you like, specific interest, which is rice breeding, developing of new rice varieties and using the thousands of varieties that are there, which obviously is a key part in many ways. It's what the farmers grow. Um, traditionally has been in the public sector, but with the development of hybrid rice, um, which is very prevalent, for example, in China, around half the rice in China is, is hybrids, but it requires a fundamental shift in how rice is grown in Asia, whereas farmers would keep the seed and plant it again year after year. With hybrid rice, you, the farmers, need to buy the seed to plant. And this provides an opportunity for the private sector. It's essentially a product. So they can develop the, the product, that is a rice variety, that if it's good enough, the farmer should buy from them every year. But the challenge is right there. Can they develop the product of the standard that they want. Um, in China, they manage through subsidies, through government programs to get hybrid rice adopted. It'll be very interesting to see what happens with this technology over the next few years. I sense Peter has something else. I just want Jeremy to, to, to talk a little bit about the trade side. Uh, is, to what extent is global rice trade a public sector, a private sector? That's, that's a price the even the public sector, <clears throat> excuse me, even the public sector, the private gets involved in, and so uh, there is some G to G uh, trade, government government to government trade, uh, but mostly, you know, if you want to know the biggest player of rice in the world, it's Louis Dreyfus Corporation, followed by probably Olam, which is actually interesting enough. They're talking about a merger, uh, an ADM. Is, a, is the biggest player probably in the U.S. And so I would say probably 20% is G to G, government to government, and of that maybe 10% is real, uh, no trade involved. So almost all of it is, uh, the trade is involved in one way or the other. Interesting development is actually Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has uh, uh, really started to increase its uh, taste for private trade for rice, uh, and there's been a learning curve Vietnam as they privatized the trade and gone from Vina One to other smaller companies, which is uh, like all learning curves. They're learning, you know, how the world market works, and so most of it's private. However, government transactions are large and they move things around. Uh, Bill, over the years, and uh, when I was with the Ford Foundation 30 years ago, even funded. Uh, Eerie programs in places like, like Bangladesh. Uh, <laughs> right, there are other incarnations. Uh, qu a question for you, Duncan. Demand for rice is going up. 
land that's under cultivation, if I understand it correctly, may be, may be going down. Land is going out of production. Yields have pretty much flattened. When I was working in Indonesia 25 years ago, we were talking about yields of four tons a hectare. What I think would be interesting for this group to know is what's on the horizon? What looks promising? Around production, as one of you two mentioned earlier, is what's happening with respect to global warming. So is your, are you focusing on yield? Or are you focusing on drought-tolerant varieties? You're constantly trying to stay ahead of new in insect biotypes that are coming up all, all the time. But tell us what, give us some hope here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Bill. Yes, um, you're right, absolutely right. The fundamental goal of the Institute is to try to increase rice production. And there's, there's two or three parts to the answer. First and foremost, it's to work with the farmers. The varieties that many farmers grow across Asia have the ability to yield more with good management. So it's what we call the yield gap. That they're growing a variety, they might be only getting three or four tonnes a hectare, but they could be getting five or six. And it might be through better use of fertiliser, better use of water, a whole range of things, better management of pests or diseases. So that would be a key area. And there's a whole range of crop management strategies out there and, and trying to get farmers to adopt them. But you know, if you already heard, we're talking about tens of millions of farmers who operate on two hectares many of them with very little education, if not illiterate. So it's a great challenge. And unfortunately, what's happened with what we call extension systems, these are the systems largely government-funded, government-run, which traditionally had the role of getting knowledge and getting information to farmers, uh, have become very underfunded, very under-resourced, and these, these extension systems don't function as they should in many countries. So for technical advice, Farmers are left in many cases with the private sector um, who have, uh, in many cases, specific products, whether it's an insecticide or a pesticide or a fertilizer that they want to use. Responsible members of the private sector do that well. And it's not to sort of label all the private sector as not handling that sort of extension advice badly. But there's a need there to get better information to farmers. So that's number one. Secondly, in the pure science of it, in the breeding of new rice varieties, as I said earlier, there is definite potential. Um, one particular project um, is called C4 Rice. And if I may just have a little one minute of science with you. This, there are two types of crops in the world, basically, C3 and C4. C stands for carbon, carbon atoms three carbon atoms in the rice plant, it's a C3 plant, and the maize plant is a C4, four carbon atoms. It's to do with the photosynthetic process, using sunlight to convert it into plant material. Essentially, corn is a more evolved plant than rice, because it's got four carbon atoms, and you only have to look at corn. It's a bigger, leafier, big ear of corn on it compared to the rice plant, smaller. And the challenge for the scientists is, could you speed up the evolutionary process and transform rice from a C3 plant into a C4? That is, give it a greatly improved photosynthetic process so it would use sunlight to produce, think of a big rice plant with lots of grain, fantastic water use efficiency, much better fertilizer use efficiently. We believe we can do it. And again, organisations like the Gates Foundation are funding us. It's going to take us 20 years to do this. It's similar, the, the Gates actually call it one of their Apollo projects. It's the only one in agriculture. Apollo as in flying to the moon. Along the way, we're going to learn so much about how plants grow and how sunlight is used to produce food. It will have enormous benefits for all of us. Already they're looking at for example, one area of rice plant that could convert nitrogen in the soil into the fertilizer it needs. Biological fixation of nitrogen, for those who know it, is available in legumes, but not in rice. That could be just one spin-off of the C4 rice plant. And that would considerably increase yields and fundamentally probably provide Asia's food security well into the next century. That's the second one. And then the third one, of course, is in uh, what we call 
biotic stresses, abiotic stresses, droughts, floods. You've seen one example there, a flood tolerant rice, drought tolerant rice is coming, uh, salinity tolerant rice for growing rice in areas of rising